Hello, and welcome to the slides on complex survey designs and weighting using this data. My name is Chris Curran, and I'm an assistant professor of public policy at the UMBC School of Public Policy. This is the first part of a three-part lecture on the use of survey designs and weighting in the data software system. In this first part, I'll be introducing the motivation and reason why we want to make sure we address complex survey designs and weighting when we think about data in Stata. So let's get started. To begin with, we're going to think about kind of the common place that research designs often jump off of, and that's the simple random sample. Probably through your initial research classes, your previous experience in the field, you've heard that the random sample has a lot of value because it allows for representativeness or generalizability to a broader audience. If you think about what a simple random sample is, it basically means that every individual in the population has the same or equal probability of being sampled or drawn into the sample that we take. So we can think of that as each individual having a 1 over n, where big N represents the population size, probability of being sampled. Now, as I mentioned, the great virtue of a simple random sample is that we get representativeness. Right? We have a sample that we can say then uh, to use to draw conclusions about the broader population. However, if we think about it, simple random samples are actually fairly rare in large-scale data collections for some feasibility reasons. Let's imagine that we wanted to take a sample of American kindergartners, 11,000 of them. Well, how many different schools do you think you would have to go to to reach 11,000 students drawn at random? Probably not 11,000 schools, but it's quite plausible that you could find yourself traveling to thousands upon thousands of schools. We think about how this just isn't going to be very functional, both from a cost standpoint and a logistics of going out and actually administering this kind of survey. A second problem that comes up with a simple random sample is the need to be able to make comments about low incident groups. So again, imagine our example of taking a random sample of 11,000 American kindergartners. How many people do you think in that sample would be, say, Asians or Pacific Islanders or maybe students that identify as LGBTQ? You can imagine that some of these lower incident groups could be very, very small, even though the size of our overall random sample can be quite big. This poses a problem, because if we want to draw conclusions about these subgroups, we may end up with insufficient sample size to be able to do so. So, enter. A solution. Clustered and stratified sampling. The clustered sampling addresses the issue of having to logistically try to reach so many different places if we were to sample uh, in a random fashion. And all clustered sampling is is sort of a series of steps in which we first sample a larger group, and then within that larger group, sample a smaller group. So in the example of schools, we could imagine instead of immediately sampling students, we could first sample schools. By doing this, maybe we sample 1,000 or 2,000 schools, a number that we think is reasonable for us to actually travel to and administer surveys. We call that first level uh, primary sampling unit, or PSU. Within the PSU, then, we could sample students call this the secondary sampling unit, or SSU. So it's quite common in large-scale surveys, particularly those done by NCES, to see some level of clustering um, across different levels. Often they'll survey a region first, schools within that region, students within the school. Stratification, in contrast, is a mechanism for dealing with the problem of low incident groups. So imagine that we wanted to make sure our data set could say something about the Asian students, or the students that identified as LGBTQ. Well, we could actually make those students more likely to end up in our sample than students that don't have those identifiers. Now, of course, this may be a little difficult for something like LGBTQ, given that that might not be something we'd be aware of ahead of time. But for something like race, this might be a, a little bit simpler. So we see this in the ECLS data, where actually Asians are oversampled. And oversampling just means that that individual is more likely to end up in the sample than somebody who does not care, carry that trait. I've represented that here graphically with the person in gold. Uh, we might say this person in gold is 2.5 times as likely as the comrade demonstrated in black to be brought into the sample. This would be an example of oversampling. And again, the purpose of this is to make sure that we have a sufficient sample size of the subgroup so that we could run analyses and ask questions about that subgroup in general. All right, so what are the implications of this? Well, these things are great both for dealing with logistics and for low incident groups. They do impose some complications when it comes to analysis. First, clustering introduces non-independence between observations. 
Remember, one of the kind of uh, assumptions of things like regressions and kind of basic statistical tests is we often assume independence between observations. But if we've clustered by sampling first a school and then students within a school, we've introduced a certain non-independence between individuals in the same school. What does this do? Well, it could mean that our standard errors are artificially low. In contrast, stratification with oversampling also results or can result in misleading descriptors. Imagine back to the example of oversampling Asian students. Well, not only if we run descriptives will it look like there's more Asians in our, our sample or in the population than there really are, if Asians differ from the broader group, this could actually throw off the results of a regression analysis or results of other um, estimators that we may want to run with our data. So as a researcher then, it's very important that we identify and address sampling design in our analyses. What this means is we need ways to address the clustering of data, the stratification, and the oversampling of data in order to draw conclusions that actually represent and are reflective of the population of interest. So in the next couple parts of this, part two and three, we'll think about how to actually implement uh, ways to address sampling designs through Stata. So I hope you'll join for the next parts, and I thank you for your attention in this segment.